Respect is really hard work. You gotta earn that. It's not gonna be handed to you on a silver platter. You gotta earn that. But once you've got it, maintaining it is a piece of cake. Hi, welcome to the Brat Busters Parenting Podcast. This is our very first episode. My name's Lisa Bunnage. I'm a parenting coach and a mom and a grandmother. And I work with my daughter, Amy Bunnage. Hi, uh, really excited to be starting the first episode. My name's Amy, and I do the marketing, behind-the-scenes, social media uh, part of Brat Busters. And also the planning. Yeah. This podcast would not be happening if it wasn't for her. So I, I love podcasts, and I just think that you should have one. So I like podcasts too, but I never know which one I'm listening to, because you know I can't figure that out. So I'm listening to something, I don't even know who it is. Well, hopefully you all know that you're listening to the Brat Busters Parenting Podcast. Uh, today, what are we going to be talking about? I don't know. Leadership parenting. Oh, leadership yeah. parenting. Okay, so what is leadership parenting? To me, leadership parenting is about bringing out the best in your kids. When you are the source of your children liking themselves and being proud of themselves, how are they going to treat you? Pretty darn good. So that's what I'm all about. I'm going to tell you the pool story because that's the best story that I have to explain leadership parenting. Uh, now, this is a true story. My son, it was his eighth birthday party. We had a pool. So we had five of his little friends over for his birthday party. So I said to them before they went in the pool, I said, by the way, we have Whaley. This is a big blow up toy that we had. I said, Whaley's over there. We didn't have a foot pump, so I didn't want to take the air out. And I said, Whaley cannot go in the pool because I'm here on my own and I'm just going to be counting heads the whole time. And three of you little boys could die behind Whaley because I wouldn't be able to see you. Fine. Okay, go in the pool. Have fun. So sure enough, they go in the pool. One of the kids took Whaley in the pool. <laughs> I kind of predicted that. But anyway. So I said to him, Whaley out of the pool now. And he said, no. And my son kind of smirked because he knew mom knows how to take care of business. So he was going to watch the show. I was in that pool in a shot, fully clothed. And I dragged that kid out. And I said, you're going to sit beside me on this bench for 10 minutes. Now, in those 10 minutes, I did not discuss what just happened. Instead, I said, I saw you at the game the other day at soccer and you got a goal. You were doing really well. And then I worked with you on that test the other day, and you got 85% out of 100. Well done. High five, et cetera. And then I asked him what his favorite PlayStation game was, et cetera. Anyway, he was having a great time. He was telling me all about himself, me, 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 and another thing about me that's great. I couldn't get rid of him. The 10-minute timer went off. He wouldn't leave. So I kept looking at my son like, help. Finally, my son got him back in the pool. <clears throat> Excuse me, got him back in the pool. And then they played in the pool for a while. And after that, they came out for cake, et cetera. This kid could not be all over me more. Lisa, can I help you with the cake? Can I help you with this? Can I help you with that? He even was telling the other boys, make sure when we go back in the pool, there's no whaling in the pool. I mean, he was so proud of himself. He was great all day long. Anyway, so then his mom picked him up and that was it. Three hours felt like three days because he was just, <laughs> would not leave me alone. He was my little shadow. Now, what I'd done was I had these rules. So I said, Whaley cannot go in the pool. And then when he broke the rule, why would I not have said, can you please take Whaley out of the pool? Why would I not have said please? Uh, it's safety, right? It's a, it was a, a, an order in that Whaley, it's a safety issue, life and death safety issue. So it was an order. Whaley cannot go in the pool. And yeah, that's it. I never give orders usually, but this is like you put your seatbelt on when you're in the car. You know, this is like life and death to me anyway. I'm a safety nut. But yeah, um, there's no way I would say please. It was just Whaley out of the pool now. When he said no, why did I not say get Whaley out of the pool again? Well, because it's not a question. It's Well, then I would have been begging. He already heard me and he already said no. So yeah, I wouldn't repeat myself. And so I dove in the pool right away. I'm in there and I grabbed him out and I was very clear. I said, now you're going to sit with me for 10 minutes. So, and also I would not have said why. He already knows he's not stupid. And also, why would I not talk to him about what he did wrong in those 10 minutes? Why did I not give him a lecture on what he did wrong? Well, he doesn't need to be reminded of it. Well, it would have made him feel like garbage. Would that have got me where I wanted to go? No. I want him to feel good about himself. That's your superpower. That was my power with kids is I made them, feel, I made them have fun. I was fun. And also I made them feel good about themselves. So all I'm doing is building them up. You deal with bad behavior, then you focus on the good kid. Discipline is a tiny part of what I teach. It's more about connecting with kids. But you, I address everything. Like if they're bad, I address it. I say, that was bad. Here's your consequence. Now let's go to the park or whatever. So you just forget about it. Anyway, and then when the 10 minutes was up, when the, my alarm went off or whatever, um, I did not say, don't take Whaley in the pool again, because I would have completely erased everything I just did. 
he would have pretty much guaranteed taking Whaley back in the pool because I would have reminded him of, hey, wait a minute, remember you were bad? <laughs> you just don't do that. So anyway, that's leadership parenting to me, sort of in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it, but that's the basis of it. So did we have questions that you were going to ask me? We do. We have some uh, questions here that people have submitted, and I will just get right into it. These are all about leadership parenting in general. So we have Michelle from the United States. Michelle's kids are six-year-old boy. We have a five-year-old girl and a three-year-old girl. And the question is, when we are doing leadership parenting and our kids tell us that we are the meanest parents ever, how do we address this or do you just not address it at all? Okay. So the key is there if we're doing leadership parenting. So in other words, if you're giving, if you're being respectful and you know you're doing the right thing, then if they were arguing, you're mean, I hate you, I hate me, I hate everybody, I just go, whatever. So you acknowledge it, that you've heard it. It's important that they know you heard it, but then you say, yeah, whatever, or alrighty then, and then just walk away. Keep it really light and airy, no anger. If you show anger, you're not a leader. Uh, they pick up on that. There's no emotions when you're disciplining, none. Or when you're dealing with bad, be bad attitude, no emotions. Do not get pulled into it. If you got upset, they just won. Interesting. How... Okay, this is, so if you're not showing them anger, I know that I've seen some questions. How do they learn how to deal with anger? And what do you mean by that? So if you're not as a parent ever showing them anger, how do they learn how to deal with anger when it comes up in them? What a good question. Well, because they see me drive. <laughs> <laughs> so you do get angry sometimes. <laughs> not when I'm disciplining though. Remember I said, when you're disciplining, you never show any anger. But yeah, they saw me drive. So that's where I got the anger out. Really, I don't have a, much of a temper, do I? I don't really have no. a temper. But when I'm driving, I don't know what comes over me. I've never given the finger or anything, but I certainly have a mouthful to say. Yeah. So the difference is it's not directed towards them. No, no, so no. That's the difference. That's right. Um, anger is something, I, mean, I guess we all have it, but I would say I get more frustrated than angry. Would you say that about me as a parent? Yeah, that feels accurate. Yeah, I was never, I never lost it. I, I, if something happened and I didn't like it, I'd just say, huh, give me a minute here. I, I'd think about it and then I'd deal with it. No, you just oh, disappointed. I had, I had the look. <laughs> the disappointment. Yeah, yeah. but I never, I, I always knew that, I always knew that, um, you know, if I looked angry, it would make me look out of control. And I wasn't. And to be honest, it's only because I had so much um, experience with kids beforehand. So it's not like I was born knowing how to do this. I learned how to do this over decades working with kids. So I knew that if I looked angry and upset, I looked out of control. Leaders never look angry. You look at a really good leader. They, they're problem solvers. They're not, they don't have temper tantrums. Not, you, not a good leader. And now you said at the very beginning, you said, if you know you've been a leader, how do you know if you're a leader? Um, because you know you're giving respect to get it. You, you just know when the kids respect you. So if you know they respect you, uh, that that's the sign. If they have a bad attitude, you're not a leader. If they're very polite and they're happy, they have high self-esteem, you're probably a leader. Okay. Perfect. We'll move on to the next question. I'm, I'm hoping I pronounce this right. Uh, Waini from Ethiopia. How do you spell that? W-O-I-N-I. Waini? Waini. Let's go with that. Yeah, sorry about that. If we've messed your name up, we're doing our best here. Uh, so we have, it's 22 month old and an eight month old baby. So you kept saying after three years old, they either become difficult or easy based on your leadership. Does it mean we won't be able to shape them after three? Good question. Uh, I get asked this a lot. Like, is three too late if they don't respect me? No, uh, it's never too late. I, I specialize in teenagers. So they can, you can have an 18-year-old and we can still sort things out. But it's a lot more work. So at three is the fork in the road. That's when you can tell if you've been a leader previously. So what I mean by that is they're going to go in one of two directions, or they might just be easy kids anyway. So they're either going to get easier or they're going to get more difficult because they stop and think. Children at the age of three have foresight. They can stop and think. Their frontal lobe is starting to develop. They're starting to get some impulse control. They literally can stop. They have the ability to stop and think before they act. If you're a leader, they'll stop and think and they'll make the good choice. If you're not a leader, they'll stop and think, you don't know what you're doing. I think I'll do whatever I want. So that's what I mean. You can always correct that, though. You can always learn leadership skills. They will follow. You lead, they will follow. Children need, crave, and want a leader. If you're not that leader for them, they're going to be very susceptible out there in the world to bullying, peer pressure, the drug dealer on the corner, the internet, the Kardashians. You get the idea. They're going to be looking for a leader. I don't know why I keep looking down. I don't, I'm not looking at I'm not even looking at anything. 
because if I look up, I see myself and that's kind of scary. Sorry about that. Go on. Just for context, we're also recording this for a uh, video as well. Oh. So if you're listening on audio, you probably <laughs> didn't know what she was talking about. Um, and is that why the Brat Busters Behavior Board starts at three? The Behavior Board starts at three because they do have the ability to stop and think before they act. Prior to that, they don't. They don't have impulse control. They, they don't even think about something. They just tend to do it. I see um, just some comments that you get is a lot of people saying that their kid is advanced or their two-year-old just, they just think they would get the behavior board. Can you start before three? I had a client who did the, uh, they, they tried to start the behavior board uh, before they, no, they got the, the course, the boot camp course. And it's, that one started at three. I have a toddler one and a three and above one. Anyway, they got the three to 12-year-old boot camp course, and their child was two and a half. And they said it was a total disaster. The kid didn't understand what was going on. And they could just tell. The kid just had no clue. And I said, you can usually start it a month or two before. But every three-year-old, unless they have some specific you know, challenges or something, every three-year-old can start it. So I've kind of said three because they can all do it, but some can start it a little bit earlier. And it's not necessarily because they're really bright or, or not so much. It's more a, a maturity thing. Some kids are just, they, they tend to stop before then think almost before they act, even when they come out of the womb. You were like that. You were very cautious. My daughter, she hardly ever did anything wrong. She was just the easiest kid in the world, but she almost came out of the womb like that. She, she never did anything impulsively. She's still like that. Well, no, that's, that's not true. The the fruit cup. Oh, the fruit cup. That was impulsive. No, I would say you thought that went through pretty well. <laughs> Let me tell the story. She was three, maybe three. Anyway. And sorry, just to clarify, so I could think before I acted. So by three. Yo, I think you thought I think you thought this one through, to be honest, right? You yeah. would have had to have. So anyway, she was oh uh, it was just because she was such a cautious child and she hated getting into trouble. She just oh she's still to this day. She doesn't tend to speak or do anything before she thinks, um, whereas I don't have that at all. I have no filter. Um, so, yeah, we're very opposite that way. Anyway, I used to keep, the, had this box in the pantry, and it's where I kept all the potatoes and onions. <laughs> she had to have a fruit cup every single day. She hated fruit. And I said, fine, what do you, you know, so I found something she liked. It was a little fruit cup, and it was raspberry and apple puree or something like that. Anyway, so she had to have one a day. So fine, she would. She was a very easy little kid. So she'd take this fruit cup and eat it. So I thought. So I went in the pantry one day and I went to get an onion out. And I stuck my hand in something gross. I thought, what the heck? I pulled my fingers out and they were all red from this raspberry fruit cup. And I looked in and I don't know how many were in there, but a whole bunch of them. You, I don't even know if you took one bite out of any of them, one spoonful. And there was all these fruit cups in there. And I was absolutely stunned because it wasn't like her to do something like that like of course it was her I knew right away and so I called her Amy and she, she knew you still remember that too you oh. were about three you were little yeah I knew I, I knew once I heard your voice and I knew that you were in the pantry I was I knew I was caught oh oh let me correct something and I I had just said earlier that I never got angry <laughs> that was a lie yeah, I was mad. I was mad, wasn't I? I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. I don't even know if I did much. It was just more that she was terrified because she never, never wanted to get in trouble and she never had. That was really the first time. But yeah, that made me mad. Yeah, but you were just disappointed. I was disappointed. Yeah. And she was so, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Well, how do I know? <laughs> I didn't well, think you'd do it in the first place. Boy, did I eat those fruit cups after. <laughs> yeah, after that, she sure did. Anyway, so yeah, there you go. So she was, but she was a very easy child. Um, so she could have probably done the behavior board because she did, was more inclined to think before she acted. Um, she probably could have done it at not two and a half, but probably what's 34 months. Yeah. A couple months before three. Yeah. Yeah, probably. But it, all kids by three can be on there. Okay. So the next question we have is from Sonia from Canada. Can both parents be leaders? Yes. But there's always one clear leader. There's always one that's stronger than the other. And you'll just know it. That'll be the one that, that the kids just tell everything to. If that's the leader. Uh, the leader is the prized role. You're, everyone wants to be the leader once they understand it. Because that's the one that the kids are the most connected to in many ways. You're the one that they, you're their safe place to land. You're the one they're going to go to with everything. It doesn't mean that they love you anymore. But you are that sort of that 
uh, guiding light, the, the mentor, the, the leader, the one that they look to um, for guidance in, in life. And well, I won't go into the teen years so much, but it kind of changes when they're teenagers because you don't want to be their leader anymore. You want to be there for the big stuff, for the backup, but you want them to be their own leaders. You want to pass the torch over. And I would say that's probably the biggest challenge that parents of teenagers face is they don't adjust their parenting to the teen years. You have to let the small stuff go. You just can't micromanage everything. And you got to let them make mistakes because you make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And if you don't allow your teenagers to make mistakes, you know, and uh, it's not fair because you make them too. So yeah, uh, the teen years are, I found them quite easy, but it's because I already kind of adjusted my parenting to that. Um, but yeah, leadership, is, you can both be leaders, but there usually is a stronger one. And also there's never an authority, there's three different styles of parenting in my, in my head anyway. The old fashioned authority, which is the dictator, my way or the highway, not a bad way to parent, but you are building resentment for the teen years. That's the problem with that style. And the please your parent style, the one that's so trendy right now, you know, discussing all their big feelings, trying to make everything easy for them. That's a disaster. You're raising self-entitled snowflakes with mental health issues. It's just, a I'm exaggerating, but it's just a disaster. I teach leadership. It's, it's, I don't even know if it's in between. It's just so different. It's more like a sports coach. You know, that person who has rules and they discipline you. You sit on the bench if you do something, you know, if you cheat or anything. Um, but the coach is usually someone who is really good at bonding with kids and the kids want to please the coach. They look up to the coach. Uh, that's someone that they feel really safe with. So that's the only role I can think of that I kind of equate parenting with. It's not like a teacher. It's not like, you know, it, it's most like a, a really good sports coach that really loves kids. So, um, but yeah, the, the old style pleaser parent, there's, there's often a leader and a pleaser. So long as the pleaser defers to the leader, then it can work because you have to be on the same page. But an authority and a leader rarely occur in the same house. I work with a lot of parents and when there is an authority in the house, they often change their ways because they'd rather be a leader because they just see that it, it probably in the long run is more effective anyway. Perfect. And we'll go on to the next question. So we have Amanda from the U.S. So Amanda's kid is 20 months old. We're a military family and husband is operational, which means he has gone frequently. How do you manage a child who sees you as a leader while partner is gone? And then when the partner returns, the child is disrespectful to you, has a hard time listening. Partner is a pleaser parent. We've previously previously discussed our roles well mm, i don't want to i don't want to go against what you said but you can't really be a leader um if if it changes when someone else is around because they follow the leader not the pleaser if your child is following the pleaser in other words they they go under the pleaser's umbrella when when the pleaser is home then you're not a leader because the leader is always the dominant force it's the dominant influence with children they are more likely to be like they are with the leader if you are a leader. So even when the pleaser's around, they're more drawn to who they are with the leader. Does that make any sense? Does so it... even with a toddler? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Even okay. with a toddler. I would say past the age of about 15, 16 months, you'll see that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, to me, 15 months and under is a baby, to me, in, just in the way I view it. 16 months uh, to 35 months is a toddler, to me the way I've done it. And does it look any different when you're trying to be a leader for a toddler versus like a three-year-old? Really good question. You don't use a behavior board. I never used a behavior board anyway. It's just a teaching tool. Um, you don't have rules and consequences. You, you are very in the moment reactive and you, use rea and you use actions like consistent corrective actions. So every time they do something naughty, you have to correct it right there in the moment. Um, you can't do it later like you can with older kids. So uh, with older kids, uh, you can have rules and consequences and you say you broke the rule, you go to the board. But with a little one, uh, if they do something naughty, you instantly say no and then you take the fun away from them or them away from the fun just for a few minutes. So you're letting them know right in the moment and they're not going to learn the first time, probably not the 10th time, maybe the 50th time or the 100th time. But you've got to be consistent because children of all ages, I don't know why, but children of all ages, remember when you mess up. They just do. They don't remember when you do stuff right, but they remember when you do stuff wrong. I remember my son once, he was, I don't know, 18 or 20. <laughs> he, we were laughing at all the dumb things I've done, usually around cooking, uh, as my daughter would know. And whenever I used to say, oh, I know what I'll do, because I hate cooking, by the way. 
Anyway, I say, I know what I'll do. And the kids would run. They go, God, no. That <laughs> so, was the, the phrase. We just knew that there was going to be a bad dinner. Let's order pizza. Yeah, I know what I'll do. Anyway, so my son and I were laughing at all the dumb things I've done, stuff like that, you know. So then I said to him, what did I do right? And he went, what? Yeah, no interest in remembering it or talking about it. But he sure remembered all the times I messed up. So we were laughing. And then I thought I'd get the balance, all the wonderful stuff I've done. That never happened. Yeah, not as good of a memory for that one. I know. It's just funny because, and also, the reason why my kids loved it when I messed up is why? Well, because you made amends. Always. Always. It makes such a difference. And also, I will say, it made it feel okay for me to mess up too. Yeah, because it's not a matter of, you don't want perfection here because nobody's perfect anyway. But if I messed up, I'd say, oh, shoot. Or they pointed it out every single time. Mom, you said you were going to bake a cake last night. And you never did. Oh, and I go, shoot, what do you want? So they, I have to make amends. They'd want to go to the water slide park or I'd have to go to the park after school and do something with them. Uh, so they loved it when I messed up because there was always something in it for them. Um, but yeah, so there's no shame in messing up. There's only shame in not being accountable for it, right? Also, that method gave me a lot of autonomy. So I feel like when I messed up, you let me kind of pick my consequence if it was fair uh, and then vice versa. Well, you asked me what I wanted from you. Absolutely. I'd say, well, okay, I messed up. What do you want? And they, my son was usually the one, right? Yeah. He'd go, he'd go, mom, we'd love to go to the water slide park tomorrow. And I'd say, fine, I'll bring your suits after school. Anyways, just stuff like that. Uh, but there is no shame in messing up. And when you said the autonomy... If you messed up and then you would always come and confess, you'd say, oh, mom, I forgot to do that or I messed up or whatever. And then I'd say, oh, okay, what are you going to do? And then you would always offer something. And then I would say, nah, that's too much. So usually they'd come in hard. So I'd ease up. Like they, like my, I remember my son once he forgot to do some chore or something and he goes, how about no video games tonight? And I said, ah, that's too much. Just brush my hair for five minutes. Something like that. So Just, they came in hard with their own punishments, but not with mine. Just to clarify, though, um, I almost always fessed up, not with the fruit cups. I did not fess up with that one. She <laughs> caught me. Uh, that was weeks of fruit cups in there. Well, quite seriously, uh, what else did you do? I'm sure I did other stuff, but if anything, I blocked it out. So <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, nothing I ever yeah. found out about. She was just really, both my kids are really, I would say, on the easy side. But then I got respect when they were tiny. You were born easy, easy going. You know, you, you just were more cautious. Whereas my son was just more normal. He was, you know, he had tantrums and, um, but you were extremely cautious from day one. Okay. I think we have one more question here. So Sydney from the U.S. Is it possible to flow in and out of being a leader within the same month? My almost four-year-old daughter is very polite, kind, and listens to us well. However, I have PMDD and it's like once I feel my hormones start to shift in my cycle, I notice her behavior gets drastically worse. It's like she's picking up on my PMS emotions, or could it be that she notices my emotions and sees that as falling out of my leadership role? Have you ever experienced this before? Thank you so much for your insight. Well, you, you can't have different personalities. It confuses them. You have to be consistent. You, you can be moody, like, you know, if you've got PMS, you can have a, a bad day, but the rules still have to be the same. Like, you have to be consistent with the rules. And if you do mess up or you do snap at the kids, they have the right. You make sure they have the right to say to you, um, I think you were being kind of mean to us yesterday. And then you should say, you're right. I had PMS, but that's no excuse. How about we go out for ice cream or something like that? Make it up to them. But you got to be consistent with the rules, though. That's the thing. You can be moody, but you, you can't, you cannot be great one week with this and then not the next week. It will never work that way. It has to be consistent. Plus, I always tell parents, you know, getting respect is really hard work. You got to earn that. It's not going to be handed to you on a silver platter. You got to earn that. But once you've got it, maintaining it is a piece of cake. So I sailed pretty much right through the teen years, but I worked to get it when they were little. So by the time they were about three, three and a half, I'd say you kids were self-disciplining. They just made good decisions because they knew mom would come in and say, hey, that wasn't very cool. What are you going to do about it? Oh, okay. We, you know, they just took their medicine so easily. So that's why they just learned that they just, why would they act out? It's not that they weren't, they didn't have to be perfect, but their behavior, they were always nice. They had to be nice. That was my thing. They had to be nice. So, and respectful of people. So they were very good that way. But they didn't have to be perfect. Like if they didn't do their chores one day because they were busy, I would do them for them. 
right? Like you didn't have, I wasn't strict with that kind of stuff. They had to do them if they could. Um, but if they were busy with, you did a lot of dance. So if they were busy with dance or something, then I would do the chore. Like it wasn't a big deal. Um, the reciprocity, you know, you give respect to get it. Because if I was busy, they would help me out too, right? It's mutual, mutual respect. You got to give respect to get it. Everyone expects to get it automatically these days. I don't know why. I guess they always kind of did. Um, but yeah, I never, I never expected that. I, I was prepared to work for it because I knew the results I could get because I'd worked with so many kids before. But yeah, I was quite willing to work for it. And I did, and it, it paid off. Well, I think that's a great place to end it. Do you have anything else to add? No, just to say that I'm. Uh, my daughter's been working with me now for uh, full time. Has it been six weeks? I think so. About six weeks. She was part time, and uh, she just came on full time. She was part time uh, for about a year, and then we realized that, you know, this could be something that the two of us really need to do together. So, um, but anyway, she's very much my partner. She. I just want to make that very clear how important she is to this business because. I'm very proud of her. She's done very, very well. She's very driven. I'm not as much. <laughs> so she keeps me in line, keeps me organized. And um, so, yeah, I'm just very, very happy that you've joined me. Well, this is like a dream. I love working with you. So Aww. perfect. And we're just so grateful as well for everyone following along. Like the kind support and outreach is just, it's amazing to be able to see. And it, we really appreciate it. Well, and I've been running this business for 17 years now. And about two years ago, I went on TikTok and it blew up overnight. It was just, no, no one expected that. It was just absolutely mind boggling. And that's why my daughter got involved. It just, she's the one who told me to go on TikTok. It took me about a year to even bother doing it. And, um, but yeah, so it's been, you know, I'm just blown away and I'm extremely grateful for everyone who, who is listening and learning and getting results. Because my goal is for you to enjoy parenting as much as I did. I want you to raise nice kids too, but that's secondary. I want you to find the joy in parenting like I did. Did I enjoy parenting? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It was the most fun I ever had in my whole life. And I'm not saying that. You know that's true. Yeah. I wallowed in parenting because I got all that pesky discipline out of the way when they were tiny and I just sailed through. So, yeah, I want everyone to enjoy parenting. That's my goal. So I think that's it. Perfect. Let's end it there. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. If you're ready to dive deeper, check out bratbusters.com to learn more about the behavior board, parenting courses, and private one-on-one -on -one coaching with Lisa. The information provided in this podcast is for general informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for professional advice. Lisa is a parenting coach, mom, and grandmother. She is not a licensed psychologist or counselor. Her services do not replace the care of psychologists or other healthcare professionals. For a full disclaimer, please visit bratbusters.com forward slash disclaimer.